Welcome, everybody, to the Channel Vision Magazine webinar featuring Crescendo, which is going to share with you how to build and launch your own UCAS solution in 90 days or less. I'm your host, Bruce Christian, Senior Editor of Channel Vision Magazine. Our Crescendo moderator is Chief Revenue Officer John Britton. Before I turn it over to John, I want to remind you that during the webinar, if you have any questions for him or his guests, simply go to the Q&A icon at the bottom of the page. Remember, this webinar is designed to provide you with information, and we don't know what you want to know unless you let us know through your questions. And now, let me turn it over to John Britton to moderate this presentation. John? Thanks, Bruce, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Brinton, Chief Revenue Officer at Crescendo. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I think we'll have a, a very interesting uh, uh, topic with an exciting panel that I'm happy to have with me. Before we introduce our panelists, I just want to tell you a little bit about Crescendo for those of you that may not be familiar with us. Uh, we have been in the industry as a UCAS provider for a number of years and merged last year with uh, NetSapiens. Um, a platform provider for UCAS uh, based in California. The culmination of that merger is actually today, we are, are deemed by Frost and Sullivan as the fastest growing UCAS platform in America. And we have over 2 million users that consume our solution each day. And we also have several hundred channel partners who have chosen, chosen to partner with us either by building their own solution, leveraging our technology, or through participating us in, in one of the other areas of our go-to-market strategy. And so really what we're going to talk about today is, you know, how you can uh, build and launch your own UCAS solution in 90 days or less. But before we get to the how you can, we should talk about the should you can. So before I introduce my panelists, what are, I'll, I'll give you a few of the reasons and, and uh, that you might want to consider that. Um, first is the increased margin in your business, the increased uh, from selling these solutions, the increased top line revenue, um, obviously building value in your company and expanding your share of wallet with your customers. And then finally, uh, the, the competitive uh, in, initiative of keeping other competitors out of customers that you're doing business with every day. And those are some of the top of mind ways that we can do that. I'll have our panelists introduce themselves. We'll talk about others and we'll kind of go through some of the things that you should consider if this is a path that you may or uh, want to be on in the future. So got a great group here with us representing uh, Rev.io, Jenny and into Sarah. I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. So Evan, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, John. Uh, Evan Rice, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for Rev.io, and Rev.io is a uh, fully sophisticated quote-to-cash platform uh, born in the cloud, and we support approximately 200 communications and managed service providers um, across the U.S. and North America today, um, currently focusing on expanding internationally, but where we help are you know, voice and UCAS providers who need to manage sophisticated usage rating, billing, um, and then we do all the tax calculation that goes on the bills that they send to their end customers. So um, we've been doing this for just under 20 years, and I'm excited to be here and to talk to everybody today. Great, thank you, Evan. Patrick? Thanks, John. Hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Howard. I'm the Senior Vice President of Vendor Management and Marketing here at Jenny. Jenny is a value-added distributor of technology products, primarily communications, equipment, networking, security equipment, and a lot of ancillary equipment. Um, right so outside of Cleveland, Ohio, we've been in business since 1986. Um, I've been with the company for just over seven years, and we have a pretty broad line card of technology partners, um, over 180, and a lot of the equipment that um, channel partners like you need. Jenny supplies it along with the services around it. So glad to be with you here today and, and hopefully help you with how you can work on your equipment business uh, through Jenny. Great. Thank you, Patrick. And Carrie. Very good. Thanks, John. Carrie Rosell, I'm Vice President and Consultant at uh, Intisera. And effective January 1, 
uh, of this year. Uh, Intesera has joined with FastTech, so we're now Intesera, a FastTech company. And that's, that's been a long time coming. Um, we, both companies have been doing um, regulatory compliance for somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 20 or 30 years each. And uh, Intesera has consulting and, and regulatory compliance. FastTech has, has sales and use tax. And combined, then we get to cover the whole uh, spectrum of compliance. And uh, you know, and we've we've both been helping uh, folks in the competitive telecom industry um, enter markets and stay compliant in those markets for a long, long time. Excellent. Thank you, Kerry. Here's a few of the topics that we'll be covering today. So, you know, I'm just going to open it up to the panel. If anybody, I gave some reasons why a, a, a business or a company might want to consider launching their own UCAS offering. I don't know if uh, any of you have any more that you'd like to elaborate on that or share with our audience. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can chime in. I think, you know, I think you mentioned a couple of these, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, voice, video and mobile you know, communications are all becoming more and more prolific, especially over the last couple of years. And, you know, a lot of times what we see with managed service providers is they don't have this practice internally and they've traditionally been referring that out to you know partners whether those are you know carrier partners or you know other competitive communications providers where they're acting more in an agent capacity for those types of services voice in particular and traditionally what we've seen is it is some of the areas that we're going to talk about today right tax regulatory fulfillment, how do I bill for this stuff? How do I manage, you know, sophisticated usage that is uh, obviously can drive up my costs if I'm not careful and I need to make sure that I'm capturing that and billing that to my end customers. So a lot of them have avoided that, but ultimately that means someone else is selling into their customer base and, you know, has that percentage of wallet share that can be so critical and you know what we're seeing is a trend of you know more and more are wanting to own this themselves, so that uh, you mentioned John, they get the top line revenue, they get increased equity in their business and business value eliminates the risks. We've certainly seen some of the big name carriers just eliminate commissions in the last couple of years and change their channel program. So you know not only does it drive enterprise value, but it de-risks the business as well. Yeah. And I, I would just add on to that. I think you hit a lot of the key points, John and Evan. Um, the growth opportunity is tremendous. I mean, we've been in the communications business for a long, long time, and we're seeing this transition from premise to cloud deployed you know, solutions. The growth has accelerated quite a bit the last two years. There's so many more remote workers. It's going to stay that way. And with the growth opportunity, with the profitability, with owning your customer, yourselves, versus some of the other offers where you, you're an agent, um, it's a great time to get into this business because there's growth, there's profit, and an opportunity for you to own your customer. Excellent. Gary, anything to add to that one? Yeah, you know, and, and uh, those are great points. And, and I think that we have uh, clients who have steered clear of providing their own services because uh, they're afraid of um, regulatory and compliance issues that come with that. And, and while on the one hand, the scared straight part of the presentation is, you ignore or trivialize regulatory compliance at your own peril. And we've seen the values of companies um, reduce significantly by, by ignoring those things. But the, the hurdle is, is not as high as, as people might think. So, you know, I, I'd say be fully aware that your UCAS offering has regulatory uh, and compliance issues, uh, but, but those are not insurmountable. Uh, they, they are to be uh, respected uh, but not so much feared. Great. And that's probably a great segue, Kerry. We, we, the next topic we had is kind of so, uh, navigating some of the challenges of entering the market. I think that, uh, you know, the first part of being able to navigate is, is having a map and understanding what they are, what, sh what you should troubleshoot or make sure you're prepared for. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more because as you've said, it's a scared straight part of the presentation. You, you are the, the person that, you know, specializes in that regulatory and compliance aspect of this. What are some of the challenges that you see potential service providers or UCAS providers facing when they're considering launching a, their own platform? 
Yeah, you know, by if, if they don't understand that they're entering into a regulated space, then there can be significant problems there. And, and it's much easier, of course, to address the regulatory issues on the front end than try to do cleanup. We, we do regulatory cleanup as well. The regulatory cleanup is much messier than, than being, you know, on the front end of it. And there's also things that can affect your bottom line uh, significantly. Just, just to be aware that federal USF is probably the biggest regulatory compliance issue in terms of a fund. And we're talking about a fund that is in, that is in the neighborhood of 30%, 30% of your interstate retail revenue. And if you categorize that incorrectly, um, you can either underpay and run into problems or you can overpay, you can kill your margins by just not treating federal USF uh, the proper way. So just be aware of the regulatory issues, uh, have, some, uh, have some awareness of, of uh, the tax and fee implications of your offering. And uh, that's a good place to start. And I think it's specifically in the case of FUSF, the uh, service providers liable, uh, you know, is liable for the, the fees or the charges, whether they collected them from the customer or not. Isn't that correct? Uh, that's right. So, so you, you report your revenue, you have these obligations. And um, again, if you're, we're talking about 30%. And so I just want to make sure people are aware that we're talking about federal USF um, and, and it's really it could go up from there. It started out as 4% um, a couple of decades ago, and it's gone grown to 30%. And until they restructure it, it's going to still be in that, in that category. And, and you are going to be responsible for that um, regardless of, of whether you have collected or not. Okay. And then Patrick, what are some of the things that you've seen or some of the challenges that people can have? Cause you know, we focus a lot at Crescendo, we're a software company. We focus a lot on the virtual part of it. You guys actually, you know, uh, do that, but also focus on the, the physical aspects. What are some of the challenges that, that you've seen folks have in launching a service? Well, um, you have to have equipment. We're all here on this webinar and we have video cameras and we've got conference phones and headsets and things of that nature. So for any kind of UCAS offer, the customer needs equipment. And the key is to try to make it easy for the channel partner to provide that equipment to the customer. I think sometimes it's it's a hassle. I don't want to deal with equipment. It's, you know, I got to do a lot of work with provisioning, so on and so forth. But working with a key partner like Jenny, the, our plan is to make it easier for the channel partners to acquire the equipment, to make it low, low touch, to have a lot of inventory available, to be able to do things like custom packaging, and we could have it shipped from our location to the end customer, fully provisioned, so it's plug and play. Our whole um, value add in this is to have the equipment that you need, whether it's, you know, again, video cameras or headsets or, or SIP phones, but make it easier for you to acquire it with very low touch or no touch so that you can make profit on it. And it's gonna drive top line revenue, it's gonna drive bottom line profit, and it's gonna keep competitors away from your customer. So again, our value add is to try to make it as easy as possible, um, John, to, to acquire and deploy the equipment. Okay, thank you. And Evan, I know you guys, you specialize in not only helping people kind of launch or get started, but you spend a lot of time going in and triaging maybe when they've had a misstart or or launch with something that was suboptimal and and you're trying to help them you know get back on the right track. What are what are some of the things that you specifically see from your focus at RevIO? Uh, I think that's a great point. You know, this is uh, oftentimes we are you know working with uh, newer providers or again managed service providers, folks coming from the channel who are now launching this as a new, you know, offering, they're not necessarily a new business. You know, the traditional carriers have always understood that you have to have a purpose-built, you know, what used to be called OSS, BSS, but purpose-built billing system to manage all of the complexity that comes with different voice offerings, usage, you know, ultimately all of, the, all of us providers want to be able to go to market with something that's competitive. And what you know what we've seen and what we know is that whatever offering you start with to get to market quickly, it's probably going to be wrong and you're going to need to iterate from there. And, you know, how flexible your system is 
And, you know, that can either enable you to make those changes or it can limit you in terms of what ultimately you can offer. Because as you start to scale a UCAS business, you know, there's, again, there's a lot of devices, there's different plans that you have to manage. Certainly uh, coming from the revenue side of the business myself, I know that we have to get creative to win customers oftentimes, in particular in as competitive an industry as this is. You know, the other thing that you need is you need your system to be able to give you good information and good data. So reporting, you know, analytics capabilities are something that we certainly focus on that allow our clients to A-B test different offerings. Um, you know, also you mentioned the USF piece certainly helps to know how much of your revenue is coming from intrastate versus interstate so that you can optimize that PIU rate and collect the right amount of tax rather than, you know, again, if you collect too little, you have exposure. If you collect too much, you're eroding your margins. So, you know, it's kind of the, uh, it's the Goldilocks scenario, right? You want that to be just right. So right. being able to get good data mm -hmm. out of your billing system and visualize that, you know, helps you retain clients, retain revenue, and ultimately, you know, make you as efficient as you can be. Great. Yeah. And that's probably a good point, Carrie. I know if people look at maybe your your name and know Fast Tech and, and others, and they know you do the help with the remittance and the reporting and things, but what are the, when we look at the next thing, which is the mitigating risk to pr protect revenue, what are the steps that you folks go through specifically to help people get it right up front? Yeah. The first thing, you know, we want to understand uh, the kind of offering um, the company has, we want to understand how to map that revenue so that it's taxed properly and it's assessed USF properly. And, and like we said before, you know, you, you owe the USF whether you have, and you can collect what you pay um, on USF, but whether you collect that USF recovery amount or not, you still owe that. So it's not, it's not collect and remit. Um, you, you collect it and you, yes, you remit it, but um, the, you, USAC doesn't care if you've, if you've, under collected on USF. They care if you've over collected from end users, but they don't care if you've under collected. And then there are, so and beyond USF, there are other federal requirements. Uh, most recently we've had issues with, um, with robocalling and robocall mitigation database. So if you don't comply with some of the federal requirements, then that can even impact your ability to route traffic. Because if you, if you don't show up on the ro robocall mitigation database, then, then your traffic is interrupted. Um, and just a, just a word about state regulation, state regulation of, of these kinds of offerings is not uh, eliminated, it's reduced. It's not like the old CLEC days where they have entry requirements in most cases. Uh, in most cases, we have registration requirements, but there are a couple of states that, that I would say haven't gotten the memo on whether the FCC has um, taken regulation from the states on an issue. So some states will continue to try to exert uh, regulatory authority. And so you have to decide if it's, a, if it's a key state for you, do you do you play along with the PUC and do what they ask, or do you push back uh, because they don't have the statutory ability to regulate your offering? But, but understanding how your services are regulated within the jurisdiction you operate is, is key. Again, not to just keep beating a dead horse, but you're going to want to categorize those revenues properly so that you're not under under uh, recovering on uh, on tax uh, and USF. It's just um, you want to be compliant and you want to be in the Goldilocks zone when it comes to um, those assessments. Good. I always like when I'm in the Goldilocks zone. I, I like that. <laughs> So, so what you guys, just so to help our audience understand, part of what you do then is you will, will come in as they're building a service or, or starting out and do an assessment and help them, you know, because people don't, you could throw a dart, right? They, you don't know all the ways that uh, taxes can be structured or, or what things need to be applied. So that's really something that you guys specialize in, right? That, that's right. And, and if somebody, you know, typically we're, 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 after the fact, the offering has been developed, uh, sales are underway, and then and then and then regulatory is an afterthought. If if it's thought of on the front end, there's ways we can things can be structured or bundled uh, in a way that's that's advantageous, and we can and we can tailor the market entry strategy so that you're not you're not taking on obligations that are unnecessary. But as you as you expand, say from one state to the next, 
that your your regulatory expansion matches your your market expansion. You don't want to just go do you know ne necessarily nationwide uh, certification if that's not necessary. So we want to tailor make it to the service offerings and the jurisdictions and uh, and make sure that that everything is taken care of on on the on the front end. Again, if we have to do cleanup, we can do that too. But it's it's much nicer and uh, and and um, and cleaner to be involved on the front end. Got it. And Evan, you guys kind of sit in the middle of the work that Carrie's doing here because they're helping you know do consulting with them up front, helping them establish their tax catalog and saying what should be applied to everything. Uh, and then on the back end, they may be uh, you know helping them remit that. But your RevIO solution is an important part of this chain of being able to make sure that yep you can actually bill it track it things like that so you you've you've probably seen some cases where people didn't do it right where you guys do what specifically how you know how is your platform different or superior or just easier to use than others that to help you know help that make that middle part happen that's so important yeah, and I think a part of it's the technology, right? Ultimately, we want to be able to provide the type of flexibility and a comparable experience that you would get if you had a you know, self-developed homegrown solution in terms of how much our clients could administer themselves, what types of changes they can make, how easy it is to add new offerings, update pricing, have unique pricing for specific customers. You know, we try to be consultative as well. We don't get into the tax advice world. We'll leave that right. to, you know, the fast tech team. But what we do is, you know, we will look at how many products does a customer have? How many different, you know, rate structures do they have? We try to help advise them on how to configure the system, whether that be commission structures, again, pricing, bundling of you know what we've seen other clients do and what we think makes sense uh, you know typically trying to be more simple tends to be better especially when you're launching a new offering you know you can get yourself caught up in limitless complexity um, we certainly see that on you know anyone who's selling through the channel how wild channel commissions can get and you know we uh, again will try to advise on what we've seen be effective um, what we also do is we do have uh, some key integrations, uh, particular one to the NetSapiens platform that helps audit what is provisioned in the switch to make sure that everything is being billed for that provides some you know, automated revenue assurance. So there's you know, some consulting on offerings, but then there's also technology that can pad the walls to help prevent our clients from hurting themselves. And then again, I think it often comes back to how easy is it to get data back out of your system to visualize that and analyze that so that you can make decisions on what's working, what's not, what customers are profitable, which plans are being adopted. You know, because what we have seen is you just have to constantly iterate. The one constant in this industry is change. And you need to make sure that not only technology is flexible, but you have a team with whoever you're working with you know, software is only as good as the people behind it. So, you know, make sure that you're very comfortable with the team that you're going to be working with, learn who those individuals are, who are the executives of the company that you're going to work with, because, you know, these are all very specialized areas that we're talking about today. And the partners you pick are incredibly important to your success, especially in the beginning. Yeah, I think that's a you bring up one great point that a lot of people don't think about in the kind of that customer lifecycle management, right? We you sell something to a customer in the original transaction. There's a lot of ways that, you know, in our in the NetSapiens platform specifically, one of the things I like to tell people is it's uh, powerful easy to manage and simple to use. We give customers the ability to go in, add additional services, you know, uh, uh, configure things themselves, things of that nature. Um, and then maybe they might go through a customer care organization or their rep or their favorite support person to make changes to their account and add more to it. Part of what you guys do specifically with our platform is you do help to make sure that all of those changes that might be made are kind of captured and then they're able to be presented, you know, in the, in that next invoice to the uh, customer in a, in a more automated fashion. So when you look at all those places where 
an account can change from when, you know, initial day of sale to implementation where there generally always is some type of configuration changes through the life cycle. You know, I think that's an important step because that for you guys, it's, it, it gives people peace of mind that they've got solid revenue assurance behind it. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. You know, ultimately, what we typically see are, you know, clients that are coming off of other platforms are doing some small portion of their customer base, a sample audit, you know, check two or three accounts, but the ability to truly go through your entire install base and check for those changes and have that type of assurance where you can do that up to every day, if you want to make sure that you're capturing all of your revenue, definitely the most profitable revenue is revenue that you already have <laughs> that you're not billing for. Um, you know, there's zero cost of acquisition to just make sure that you bill accurately for services that are being delivered. Um, and that's a, that's a product and a feature that we've you know worked on and enhanced over the last few years. And I think is in a really good place and starting to be utilized by more and more NetSapiens clients. Right. Yeah. And so, Patrick, one thing just to, to shift gears a little bit, uh, I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, I know a lot of the, the folks that we talk to that are uh, considering launching a service or they build them, you know, they're, they are very, tend to be very technology focused and what's the power of the platform? What can it, it do? What can they deliver? A lot of times they don't, they're not thinking about the, the physical pieces of the desktop devices, camera, you mentioned, you know, headsets, things like that, that customers need, or maybe interfaces with paging systems and, and those other types of things. And, you know, one of the things that I think is, you know, that is that you mentioned that I love about Jenny is that you guys have been in this vertical for so long. So in you, you work with most of the major manufacturers. So you've got, you know, it, it becomes a, an embarrassment of riches sometimes on what they do choose to pick and fulfill. But tell me a little bit about how maybe you take a new partner through that kind of you know, discussion, decision-making process and kind of help them hone in on the inventory. Cause I think it's, you know, Evan said that these things tend to change, but you got to have a base point and you need a partner you can grow with. So how do you, how do we make those physical products kind of fit with our virtual world? Yeah. Yeah. Really good question. Um, first thing is we've got great support teams dedicated to the key manufacturers, you know, that, that a lot of channel partners are looking for in the UCAS space. Um, you know, Poly, Yealink, Snome on the, you know, the set side of it, um, Poly headsets, Algo paging equipment. So, you know, we have experts that can talk about the latest and greatest models. They can talk about interoperability. They can talk about if this model from this manufacturer is not available, <laughs> what could work in, in place of it. So we try to make it really easy to find the right equipment and support it and educate our channel partners as they look for equipment to go out there and deploy UCAS. And it's not just on the communications gear, it's also on the network side of it, access points and switches and SD-WAN. Um, we've got great support teams, you know, pre-sales engineers and also, you know, business development folks that can work with our channel partners on those type of products. Um, you know, we really want to provide a full service with all the different type of equipments and all the support resources and expertise here at Jenny for any kind of need that a channel partner needs for equipment on the UCAS deployment. And just take a step back from that. Number one, for UCAS to work, you have to have the equipment, right? You, you, right. you know, your distributor has to have the inventory that you need for a deployment. Um, now there's a lot of inventory challenges out there today, as we all know with what's going on out there, but you know, we try to do the best we can to buy high quant quantities of equipment and have a lot of it on our shelves. We're not afraid to go deep on inventory because we know how things work out there. You can't be successful deploying UCAS if you don't have equipment. So having it there for you or having good alternatives, but also, again, this is kind of table stakes. You have a deployment, you need the right equipment delivered at the right time, highly accurate, right? Again, right. the greatest UCAS offer in the world, you're ready to go. If you don't have the equipment you need to deploy it when you need it, uh, you're not going to have a happy customer. We really work very, very hard to support our partners across all those different aspects of equipment as they, they go out there and sell, you know, crescendo, net sapiens to their, to their customers. 
Boy, and you, you, you use the magic words. I think we'd all be shaking our head. Yes, you don't hear a day without stories about supply chain issues. Right. So, you know, I, I, know, I know some folks that have gone the direction of launch your own service and they try to take in and manage some inventory themselves and self-fulfill and things like that. And, and obviously with the environment we're in today, that's just not practical at all, is it? Yeah, let, let, let us do it, right? Let us have the inventory. You know, from a cash flow perspective, why have cash out with inventory that you're holding on to? Let us do that, right? Um, you buy it, we, we deploy it and sell it, move it to wherever you want it to go. So there's really no need to do that anymore. The other thing that's out there that we can help with is there's, there's financing options for equipment as well. I know a lot of clients want to rent their equipment along with their seats, right? Well, we can help with that, whether it's hardware as a rental program or the end customer, you know, is going to have titled the product and they got to pay the monthly bill. Or if you want to rent that out and you get billed monthly, there's a couple different um, finance models as well that could help um, based on what the channel partner needs are, what the end customer wants. Um, so we offer those kind of things as well, John. It's, it's all about making Good. sure, again, we have the inventory, don't get your cash tied up. And if you need a different way to finance it so you don't have equipment on your books, we can help you with that as well. That's a great point, because that is one thing people are building an MRR business, which in your overall business valuation, ultimately the recurring revenue has a greater value. But in that meantime, you got to get over the bridge of being able to fund your sales, fund your customer implementation, you know, fund that physical equipment. So that's, uh, you know, I'm sure that's a big help for a lot of your, your partners when you offer them those services. Absolutely. It works in many cases, works well. Yeah, we have one question which uh, the audience put in specifically for you, and it's, and it's asking about what kind of support does Jenny offer for troubleshooting equipment? Is there kind of how-to or tutorial content that you offer? or So maybe it's, it's the, the troubleshooting or taking care of problems, but then also, you know, is reverse logistics and things like that, RMA, a service that you offer as well? We, we have post-sales technical support for our channel partners. That's something that Jenny offers. Um, so we've got a team that know the equipment well, and we can provide post-sales support and troubleshooting for the equipment that we sell. Absolutely. Now, there are times where it's not the equipment, it's the platform, or it's somewhere else to go, but um, we do offer those post-sales services to our channel partners from our tech team. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, as we kind of step back and think about it, um, you know, one of the, the, the big question here is how to create a successful UCAS offering. You've all talked a little bit about what you've seen. I will tell you from, uh, you know, the Crescendo Net Sapien side, what we see in a lot of cases is, you know, people will start and launch an offer of this type with maybe uh, an open source platform or something that they can take, build themselves and, and start to scale from a, a, a UCAS uh, a software layer deployment to support customers. And I, what we run into regularly, and it's a similar version of, of what you, you have all conveyed, is that that's great maybe to start and be small. But as you start to build and scale your service, you need to, you know, it's just like your physical equipment with your regulatory or with your billing system. You need to make sure you have industrial grade, you know, technology that you're building and, and scaling on. And so one of the things that the probably the biggest source for us of new partners that that uh, you know, come to us and end up deploying our solution. Folks, they've started with something else and grown it to a point where it's just too difficult to manage. It's either an open source or maybe an inferior platform or something like that. And so I, I think, you know, the one common theme that we have from everybody here on the panel is, you know, think industrial grade, right? If you actually, if, if you as a, a, a service provider, become as successful as you envision becoming does your platform and do all the tools and partners that you have in your ecosystem allow you to continue to scale because you know that is the biggest pain point that we see as we add and we added many of them uh, last year uh, new service providers to our portfolio, uh, people launching with NetSapiens, and it's the biggest challenge that drives them to us is the lack of avail avail ability to scale 
um, based on the platform or other components of the service that they offered. And that's one of the things I think, you know, Patrick, you, you know, to kind of underscore what you're talking about, you really, you take that part of it off of their uh, plate. You support some of the largest UCAS providers that are out there. So I think you can, you know, support folks that are a little bit lower volume than some of the biggest ones in the industry, right? Yeah, from small, small deployments and not a lot of seats to, like you said, industrial or, or you know, enterprise level type of deployments. I mean, the, in, in the beginning, if you're doing start, starting something new, um, maybe you can do things manually where we we ship phones and then you do the provisioning. But we have the complete avail, you know, uh, ability to do um, integration with our channel partners, API integration. We can deliver MAC addresses where they need to go. We can do no touch, we can deliver equipment where they can be plug and play. So from very small deployments to very large, again, our whole you know, value add is to make it as easy as possible for the channel partners, no matter what size the deployment is for their equipment. And we have all the capabilities from very basic to very advanced based on where the channel partner is and what their needs are. Great. Okay. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about, you know, creating, putting the ingredients in the pot to create that, you know, successful UCAS offering. I think, uh, Evan, one of the things you mentioned is, you know, and I've experienced this too. First, you got to realize the service as you build it on day one is probably not the exact same thing that you're selling 90 days later. There's lots of adjustments, changes, things like that. You guys even sometimes, because you do have so much expertise in, in this area, um, in just service creation, you actually ideate and work with your customers some on helping them kind of give them some best practices for how to get this going right properly, right? So, so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, we do. So, uh, you know, when we onboard new clients, we have a project manager that's just responsible to manage the tasks related to getting the software up and running and, you know, taking the suit off the rack and getting it tailored the last 20% to the specifics, you know, for each individual client. They also get a solutions analyst who's really our configuration expert. And they come out of our client success and account management organization. So they work with our current clients as well. So this isn't just for new providers coming on, but they're also doing ongoing support. You know, we certainly have seen the M&A environment has been aggressive over the last couple of years, not slowing down. So they will, they'll work with our clients who will do mergers, acquisitions, maybe even are acquired by another company and now need to really re-architect their business and how they're using the system. So, you know, they have incredible experience because they're doing this every single month, every single day, where they're working with a variety of providers who, you know, offer all different segments of services. UCAS and VoIP is probably our number one. But then again, you get into managed services, mobility, uh, connectivity. You know, so everyone has some idiosyncrasies to their business, but they have you know, seen it all in terms of all of these segments. So again, in terms of what works in the market, you know, we certainly are, are going to leave that to our clients, but how that translates into our system and what we've seen other clients do, which does directly relate to what they're providing and what they're selling, we are going to give that advice and they're certainly going to be consultative in terms of how to turn your offerings into something that can be automated and you know build in an automated fashion to your customers as well as what are best practices to make sure that you're being efficient you know even something as simple as a daily report that we provide that shows any calls that were not able to be rated you know whether that meant they didn't have rate structures or there was a phone number that was coming across on the call detail record that isn't in the billing system. You know, so similar to that reconciliation tool that we provide in NetSapiens, we do have other fail safes that really provide this information to our clients to make sure that they know whether things were set up properly and that they don't miss out on revenue. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And I think that we had another question and I, I would encourage our audience, if you want to type in any other questions, we'll make sure we address them during the, the session. But this one was probably as I think through, you know, the question was how difficult is the day to day management? And I think of this group that probably applies more to, to you and to me, 
than it does maybe to carry in uh, Patrick because that's the, you know, the benefit that they get is they're, they're looking at a little bit longer term slices of the business. So, you know, from our perspective, that's, that's one of the things with uh, our UCAS platform, you know, we find, and we, we do also directly offer this to end customers ourselves. So we kind of live the experience of having customers that we curate and, and we support with at, at an end customer level, along with providing platforms to service providers. But, you know, our team is very focused in their development on uh, improving the ability of our operators to be able to just simply operate and manage the platform on a day-to-day. It operates at a very high level of, um, uh, uh, of reliability, but then it's the ads, moves, changes, those kind of things that um, are part of the, the day-to-day life of someone. And, and having a, a team that supported a different uh, UCAS platform or multiple UCAS platforms in the past now versus the NetSapiens platform, I can tell you the day-to-day management of the technology platform that's underlying your UCAS offer with us is very easy. The other area, though, where you've got a lot of potential changes or just day-to-day management, Evan, is that is the is the billing system or the 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 BSS OSS that you guys touch. So you you spend a fair amount of time on working on user experience to make that easier, right? We do. And uh, again, a lot of the areas of the system can just be automated. So, you know, you set up your rate structures, your pricing structures for your individual customers. Um, and then the system is going to automatically rate usage as it comes in. It's going to automatically put those on the bills. It's going to tax appropriately based on the tax database that you choose to use with our system. And we support all the major tax databases in the industry um, to do that calculation. And then again, we set up reports to provide information in terms of what was billed, what wasn't able to be billed. You know, really in terms of day-to-day administration, you do need to have someone who's entering your new orders, you know, as you're signing up new customers and building those specifics in terms of what products did they purchase? What was the pricing that you sold to that customer? And all that can can be configured on a customer by customer basis. Um, We certainly do have clients who leverage integrations to platforms like common CRMs that can automatically populate that information. We do have a robust API. So you certainly don't have to do that manually. Um, But we do train our all of our clients on how to enter that information in the system. But once those accounts are set up, you know, the system's really going to run on its own. Um, there are settings where if clients want to have manual intervention before bills are created to do things like spot checking and double checking invoices, and that can be done based on segments of customers as well. If you want a little more handholding on your large enterprise segment, but you just want your SMB, to bill in a fully automated way, all of that's configurable. So, you know, typically it's at least a portion of a person's job. You know, it's not a full-time employee required to administer the system, but it is best to have someone who is dedicated, who becomes your SME internally on the billing platform. And, you know, then they, you know, who's going to be spot checking it and who's going to be looking at this information to make sure everything is working as you would expect. Um, but I would say it's typically probably at least maybe a quarter of an FTE in terms of, you know, how much time you're spending on a monthly Great. basis doing all of your administration, spot checking, et cetera. Great. And Carrie, we have to go back because we're talking about creating that successful UCAS offering. How do you guys work with your clients to help get them into the Goldilocks zone up front so they can start that way from the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. We had um, one client asked us one time, you know, she said see, they were a large, a large uh, company. And she said, am I going to get the gold medal for regulatory compliance? And I said, well, who's handing out the medal? And she said, like the FCC and the state PUCs. I said, well, because uh, she didn't want to get the gold medal. Her position was if, if the FCC and the state PUCs give the gold medal uh, in compliance, you're probably spending too much time and, and energy and money with compliance. Now, if your CFO gives you uh, the gold medal for having achieved that exact balance, um, then that's a good thing. So depending on who's handing out the award, uh, you either want to get the gold medal in compliance or you, or you don't. 
Um, and so it's, it's all about, it's all about um, uh, satisfying the requirements. Um, you don't need to go overboard with it. There's a regulatory philosophy that, well, it, you know, I heard it mentioned before, you know, if you have large clients and small clients and you can um, assemble best practices and understand, you know, what was typical in this, in this market uh, among the big players and the small players, it does allow you to arrive at a, at a, at a, at a destination in terms of compliance and revenue allocation and, and, and bundling and, and all kinds of things related to your, your, um, your, your tax and USF obligations. It helps you arrive at that, at that sweet spot. And, and again, there's, there's no exact, um, for some of these things, there's no exact right answer, but there are, are some, there's a range, um, uh, there's a happy range there that we can definitely help clients find uh, that will minimize their risk uh, and also keep them from overpaying uh, and then and getting their picture hung up at the FCC as the you know as the as the greatest USF contributor in the history of the of the fund. Yeah, that's funny. Don't want to be on that wall, right? No. So Patrick, and that, another thing that I think is interesting when you talk about the physical part is you know one thing in in just in the sales process, I, I always coach our our team and have forever in that. You know, don't don't give people too many options, right? Sometimes we can overwhelm our customers or potential customers with the world of choices. And because you guys, you know, do represent so many brands and give them access to so many brands, there, there's probably a part of the success sometimes with you might be helping them know of all the things they can offer, what are going to be the most relevant or most reliable and, and not maybe carrying too many SKUs. Even even though we we like people to have SKUs and move things, there's a there is a point of focusing in and doing a few things well as opposed to having too big of a a, a line card. Yeah, we we find that a lot, especially in the past where there's a platform, a manufacturer, you know, with a certain certain SIP phone or certain networking manufacturer and their equipment that that the service providers settle on. Um, and they kind of stick with that. They know it well, they know how to support it. Um, and they can really, really, you know, sell it up front. They know what they're getting. It's easy to manage. But what has happened a little bit, John, is with, with some of the challenges and supply chain and inventory availability, some of our channel partners that have been settled in one manufacturer have had to open up a little bit to be open to different manufacturers that have availability. Right. But in general, John, you're right. We like to you know, if you got the right SD WAN, the right SIP phone, the right headset, and the right networking partner, and you know that inside and out, typically they stay in in those uh, manufacturer streams. So it's very common. But we've had to we've had to improvise a little bit the last two years. Right. So I guess you'd say you have a deep bench, right? So maybe uh, more yeah. so than some of the football team special teams units last weekend, you you have a deep bench that you can go to for people to if you if they need to for backup. Right. If, if this one isn't there and this one's not there, we have a third third choice that we can help you with. That's one of the one of the advantages of having a, a fairly broad line card that we offer, but not too broad where we don't know our what we offer well enough. Um, but broad enough where we can support different types of opportunities based on availability and other needs that our, our, you know, our customers have. OK, thank you. And then one, one of the things for our audience just to understand uh, that's different specifically about NetSapiens and, and our uh, technology platform for UCAS, we've had a longstanding motto that our, our offer is built around sessions, not seats. So what that means is actually you license it to a utilization level that has to do with the number of customers that are concurrently using the service as opposed to the number of seats. So when you're talking about creating a successful UCAS offering, that allows you to do a lot of things from a commercial perspective that may be more flexible and create some differentiation between your solution and the market than other platforms that are licensed kind of at a seat or a user level. You can really look at some vertical use cases because I know some MSPs and, and channels that come to us specialize in specific verticals where they've got different needs than others and kind of create offers that are more customized for the market segment that you're going after. I think it's important when you're creating an offering that you do think about who is the end customer that you're targeting. You know, Evan talked a little bit about selling through agents and channel partners. And if that's going to be your go-to-market, 
you know, you need to specifically tune your offer for that audience because it's an incredibly, you know, competitive market at a, a certain level with some of those. If there's specific verticals you're going after, specific use cases that are really interesting where you're combining technologies um, together um, and, and bringing and then packaging the voice services or the UCAS services as part of that. All of those things are areas that really need to inform as your offer as you build your service catalog or put it together. And the one thing I can tell you is with the NetSapiens platform, that sessions not seats model that, that we use um, is hugely beneficial. Another thing that we do that uh, uh, helps a lot of our partners get started quickly, and uh, we'll transition into, into that part with the, the panel, is that we will either license our services, our, our software to you in a perpetual license to where you can deploy it, manage it in your own infrastructure and do things like that, or we have a service where we actually host it uh, and manage it for you as well in our data center. So for a lot of our, our service providers that come to us and they go, we want to do this, we may you know, want to host it ourselves over time, but we're, we're launching a new service and we're starting, we have a starting point we're at. Us having the ability to launch that and, and host it for you in uh, tier five, class five data centers, which are extremely reliable and provide multiple nodes of an active, active, active type of deployment for maximum reliability, really takes a lot of the pressure off of kind of managing the infrastructure. I think that's one of the things I really like about uh, what Patrick said is that, you know, all that physical stuff, outsource it to them, right? They, they take care of it, let them manage it for you, understand what their services are. We do the same thing with the software deployment we work with you on the service curation of, of what you want to build in your offering um, and then also um, help you plan how to launch that and how quickly we can launch it. But if we need to, we host it for you and provide that in our SNAP Excel services as part of our offering. So we're going to go around one more time before we get to questions. But, you know, we we did this session before at Channel Partners and I asked everybody, you know, how long for because the 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 title of the you know we have to prove the statement the title of the session today is how to build and launch your own uh, UCAS solution in 90 days or less so I'll ask each of you as we kind of go around and we talk about launching quickly and maximizing your profit margins for your specific you know part of the solution there how how long to to get a partner launched with you so Evan I'm going to toss it to you first in the in the line with the title of the session, if you are launching a new offering, uh, you know we used to be around that ninety day mark or less. Over the course of the second half of twenty twenty one, we were able to move net new implementation durations to sub sixty days. So um, that was a that was certainly a, a large effort by the team to make sure we were streamlining enablement, the project plans. Also, just uh, how quickly we can get usage importers developed so that we can pull in uh, usage. We actually were able to work with the NetSapiens team, and we now have a playbook specific to NetSapiens where we have standardized formats, standardized rate decks. We actually don't even need our client involved in that effort to be able to mediate and bring in usage information into RevIO. Um, you know, if you are a larger provider who is launching a UCAS offering, but then says, well, I've got legacy system data that I also want to be able to bring over and we need to do a full migration and harmonize these business lines. It can you know, certainly take longer, but if you're doing a greenfield net new implementation, we can have you up and running in 60 days or less. Awesome. So we got a 60 days or less there and, and, uh, I've seen it happen, so I know that's true. Kerry, what about you guys? Yeah, depending on the markets that, that you want to enter, um, we can have somebody up and running, I'd say, um, in, in less than 30 days. Um, but I, th I think for planning purposes, if somebody wanted to say um, um, 60 to 90, if they were had, if they're in multiple markets. But, um, yeah, the regulatory um, hurdles don't have, to, um, don't have to delay your deployment. And so we can do that very quickly. And, uh, and um, so, yeah, it could be as little as 30 days, um, but in almost no case would it go past 90. 
Okay, excellent. Patrick? We can work as fast as the channel partner wants to work. We can have an account set up here at Jenny for you in the matter of a day or two. Um, we could have our business development folks spend time training you on a certain manufacturer like a, a Poly or a Yalink. We have experts ready to take you through the product. Um, there are situations where the manufacturer has got specific programs, um, you know, certification programs, training programs, which we can coach and guide our channel partners through to help them get required certifications. But really, we are here to work as fast as the channel partner wants to. And um, we can get somebody up and running in a matter of days, John, if that's what the, if that's what the need is. Great. That's awesome. And I can tell you from the Net Sapiens perspective and, and having uh, lived it when we merged the companies together, uh, we can do that as well. Uh, you know, there's a there's a question here I'll weave into my answer from from one of the audience members is that um, question was, you know, do, can we host it ourselves? So in our or, or do you host it for us? And so in our case, either if you're building it to host it yourself and your team is ready and able, we will uh, facilitate helping you get that done within that 90 day window. And if we're hosting it for you as well, and, and we know what you're what you want to deploy, we get through that service creation phase. Um, we can do that as well. Uh, and the second phase uh, piece of that question, and if anybody has any final questions, as we're going to wrap up here shortly, you can type them in and, in the panelists will answer them. Is there was a bit about um, you know is the Net Sapiens platform uh, hosted for or unique to each service provider? And our model is exactly that. You're you're not in a shared tenant situation where it's a platform that's hosting multiple service providers in the in the same um, in the same technology stack. We, we, we will either help you build your own or build your own for you within our infrastructure that's a, a, a unique platform that's dedicated to you, that maintains your customer's data, that you can then apply any additional uh, uh, controls you need to for your own individual regulatory and compliance uh, perspective as it comes to different certifications that are available. So, so this it's it's your platform. You build it, you know, and that's one of the things I think all of our panelists have shared with us is there's really you have to think about you know what are you targeting and leveraging the people that are the experts like we've had here today to help you create that service delivery vision of what you want to provide um, to your customers. So. I'll do a last check of the questions to see if we have any more questions and answers today. Uh, Evan, any closing thoughts while we review that? Uh, yeah, I just think, uh, you know, ultimately, I think I mentioned it at, at least once, but, you know, as you're going through and thinking about this, it's important to find the right technology. It's also important to find the right partners. And it always helps when the partners that you pick are already partnered together, right? There is a, uh, this is a, pretty tight knit ecosystem. There's a lot of pieces that go into making an offering like this successful. And there can be a pretty fine line between it being successful and it not being successful. So make sure you find people that you're really comfortable with, that you feel like have the right experience, that you know where they are, how accessible are their teams, what are their processes from onboarding, customer service, you know, where are their people? Uh, you know, RevIO, we focus a lot on bringing on employees that meet our ACTOP values. You know, we, everybody who interacts with our clients are full-time employees of our company. We're not offshoring or outsourcing that. And, you know, we find that that's really important because when challenges come up, which they always do, in particular in launching a new business or a new business segment, that you, know, you ultimately have to be able to rely on the partners that you've chosen and you have to be confident as you work through those challenges. So, um, you know, the, again, the partnership that we have with our clients and the people on our team, I think are a big strength of our organization. And we hear that regularly from clients. Technology obviously is critical and it's breathing air that you have good software when you're a software company. Um, but, you know, I, I advise everyone who is attending this today to, as you're evaluating partners, make sure you get to know the people that are behind the company as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, Kerry? Yeah, you know, um, this is the kind of thing, the regulatory and compliance issues are things that, that uh, you can take on yourself. 
and and many people have done that. If you talk to some of them, they probably have a glazed look um, that is is um, shows how how difficult or um, uh, mind boggling some of that can be. So you want to have a good partner on that, and uh, so and and it's 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 cost effective. So it's not the kind of thing that's really worth trying to do on your own, in my opinion. And uh, you know so. And uh, get it's the right cost, costly if there's any mistakes, right? That's the yeah, bottom the, line. The, the, the cost of mistakes is very, very high. The cost of compliance is, is way low compared to the cost of mistakes, that's for sure. Great. All right. Thank you. And Patrick? Yeah, just at the, you know, the time is now. We talked earlier about the opportunity in UCAS and cloud-deployed communication uh, solutions. So take advantage of the opportunity. And, and equipment is an important part of it. Um, but there's an easy way to work the equipment in so you can recognize top line, you can add profit, you can keep your competitors out. Um, and we're here to take as much off your hands as possible as you go and launch your UCAS offer. So um, thanks for the opportunity, John. I thought it was a great sure. session. Yeah, thank you. And that brings to mind a couple of stats for our audience, because I think some people go, well, this market seems pretty mature, but the reality is still close to 60% of the market in North America hasn't transitioned from premise to cloud. And Cavell Group, who's an industry group that a, a lot of us are, are, are members of or are familiar with, with the, with the Cloud Communications Alliance, they did a survey recently that said 30% of customers indicated whether it was a premise deployed communications or cloud, 30% of them had, had thought they may change their provider in the next year or so. So it's a huge amount of opportunity uh, still out there. Uh, there's a final question that I'll answer before I hand it off to Bruce, which is, you know, what defines Ascension and how is it priced versus the seat model, just as because it relates to our platform. Um, just think of Ascension as a concurrent user or a, 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 a channel that's in use uh, in the software. And what's different about that versus the seat model is we talked a little bit about vertical strategies and use cases. You know, everybody's not off hook at the same time. Many of our service providers, uh, you know, will have up to 20 seats tied to a session, we give them the ability to look at the usage characteristics of their sessions that they have with us and to be able to, uh, you know, forecast over time what the requirements are for additional sessions or capacity. But when you go into some vertical use cases, there's some vertical use cases where that leverage might be greater than 20 to one or 30 to one. So what it does is it gives you an extremely cost-effective platform that you can build your UCAS on with and help you to maximize your margins overall. So if this is something you're strongly considering, great technology that's easy to manage, that the, the platform you're built on, that's at the core of the offer. And that's a critical decision. In, at Crescendo Net Sapiens, we'd love to talk to you more about that, more about how you could test drive if you want to have some experience with our platform prior to launch. And with each of my panelists today, they're here because their companies are experts and they do help companies like yours be successful as they look to launch these offers and expand their offerings. So I want to thank each of my panelists for joining today. Um, you know, when we originally scheduled the, and talked about this, I think I told all of you that for your category or expertise, I reached out to you first. So I'm glad that we could all be together and uh, kind of share that wealth of experience because um, I think that you really bring the basics that folks need to be successful to uh, this type of venture. So Bruce, you want to close this out? Well, sure. Um, if I could say anything though, I'd say that the theme for today, uh, I'd say that this was the Goldilocks of webinars. The amount of information you gave us is just right. So um, before I do that, though, I was wondering, would each of you like to let our attendees know how they can reach you? Sure, John, you Kevin. Yeah, I can dive in. So uh, uh, rev.io is the name of our company. It's also our website and domain. So rev.io. Um, and you can reach us by email at info at rev.io. Great. Patrick? Yeah, so jenny.com is our website and sales at jenny.com is the easiest way to reach us. Um, you can reach me as well, phoward at jenny.com. Feel free to send me an email. Yep. Gary? 
Yeah, uh, intosera.com, like everybody. And then if you want to reach me specifically, uh, crocell at intosera.com. Yeah, and I'll just give everybody a not spelling lesson to find Crescendo at C-R-E-X-E-N-D-O.com. And uh, you can uh, either reach us at sales at crescendo.com, Jay Brinton at crescendo.com, reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find there, just messages. And, and I will tell you, this is a really proactive group. So uh, if you have any questions, please follow up with our panelists uh, and, and we'll help you in any way that we can. Ruth? All right, fantastic. Thank you, John. Uh, John is the Chief Revenue Officer of Crescendo. And thank all your guests, uh, Carrie Roselle, Vice President and Consultant for Intesera Consulting Group, Evan Rice, Chief Revenue Officer for RevIO, thank you, Evan, and Patrick Howard, Senior Vice President, Vendor Management and Marketing for Jenny. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And now from all of us at Channel Vision Magazine and our friends at Crescendo and John's guests, thank you for attending. Have a safe and prosperous day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.